Hello, Joe Neville here, back with another Aruba AOS CX Basics video. In this video, we are going to be tackling BGP of the external variety. External BGP, or eBGP for short, runs between autonomous systems. And by that, we mean groups of devices under the same management. Now, traditionally, you would have BGP running between service providers. So the service provider would run something like ISIS or OSPF within their network, so the devices that they own and control. And then when they needed connectivity off out of their own network, they would use eBGP to peer with devices that they didn't own and they didn't trust. OK, so the focus of BGP is one of them is scale, but it also it gives you a high degree of filtering and root policy that can be applied. And by that, I mean that you have lots of attributes that you can tweak within your BGP prefixes so you can control and manipulate the traffic, your ingress and egress traffic, let's say. But the flip side of that is that it's actually quite static. So if you think about OSPF, turn on OSPF on an interface and it starts multicasting and trying to find any other OSPF speakers out there. BGP is not like that. You have to go in and configure each one of the destination IP addresses. So the peers, because BGP uses TCP, so you have to configure the neighbor, which is the destination for the TCP SYN, to start setting up that BGP connection and start peering and then exchanging your prefixes. Um, now, in the past, I've mentioned the traditional uh, design, which would be ISPs, and BGP would very much be the domain of network engineers that were working for service providers. But nowadays, you see a proliferation of use cases. So first of all, we had BGP moving into the data center with spine and leaf designs, and now it's moving into the campus as well. So a lot more network engineers need to know about BGP than they needed to, you know, about 15 years ago, I would say. And I put it in brackets because it is kind of controversial in some network networker blogging circles I could say um, because there seems to be a bit of an over alliance and if you see a spine and leaf immediately jump to the you know the assumption that you need to be running BGP there whereas actually OSPF may just work out fine for you. Okay, here's the to-do list for this video then. So what I've got set up is I've got a couple of Aruba AOS CX 6300s, which I've connected together and I'm running a layer three connection between them. It's a VLAN, it's trunked actually, for reasons which will become apparent in a moment. And over the top of that, I'm going to configure eBGP to set up the peering between them. I'm gonna advertise a few networks and then then I'm going to check on Wireshark. So if you are trying to learn a protocol, my advice is to set it up, mirror the traffic onto Wireshark and just sit back with uh, your favorite hot beverage and uh, enjoy, the <laughs> enjoy the show essentially. So just check the packets as they go. So it's much, much easier to sit and watch Wireshark and pick out what is going on with the protocol as it comes up or and it, it exchanges its roots and then goes down that's much easier when you can see it in front of you I feel than trying to memorize something out of a textbook so we're going to look at Wireshark I'm also going to check the BGP table run through that because reading the BGP table is always a good skill and we're going to have a look at the log so that's quite a simple setup and then to finish up Three is the magic number, which is wise words. I'm going to set up an extra uh, 6300 so that we've got three autonomous systems there. And then we'll be able to see where we've got networks coming in from different paths on my 6300-1. We'll have a look where we've got multiple updates coming from different sources. Okay, so that is the setup. Here I am on my first Aruba 6300. Let's show you the configuration. Pretty basic stuff. Now, the important point actually is this physical interface, 1 slash 1 slash 10. That goes off to a layer 2 switch, and I'm running a couple of VLANs across that. So it's a trunk, I'm running a couple of VLANs, and those are the logical, so the layer 3 links for my two BGP sessions. But we are focusing on the 1 to 6300 2 to start with and that's on VLAN 50. So we're just focusing on 50 to start. 
you can see the layer three interfaces here. So VLAN 50, it's 192.168.50.0 slash 31. I've also got that mirror session there and I've got my loop back. Okay, so let's start configuring BGP. So we're going to conf router BGP 65001. So I'm declaring my AS. Let's also for good hygiene put in our uh, router ID. Also by default, the neighbor up down messages are disabled on AOS CX so that they don't feel the log. You can turn them on if you want to see them here with BGP log dash neighbor changes. Okay, now we declare our neighbor. So this is dash two, the other end of that slash 31. And the remote AS is 65002. Okay, so just a note about those peering addresses, because I've seen some people that are new to BGP getting a bit confused and thinking you would always have loopbacks for your peering addresses. Now, with the traditional model, okay, now, and the, and you can have loopbacks for eBGP, but with the traditional model, iBGP, so internal BGP was BGP of devices that you owned, you would lo use loopbacks because that's a good way to have redundant paths to the loopback. So you could have different links to it, making your connection more resilient. With eBGP though, in the traditional model, you didn't own the other end of the link. So how would you get to its loopback? Because you didn't have, your device doesn't have a directly connected link to a loopback. It needs to learn about a loopback some way. So you'd either have to put in a whole bunch of statics to point to it, or you would run an interior gateway protocol off to the other AS, which is, that's a, you know, a huge no-no. You would, that's completely contradictory to what you're trying to do with eBGP. So you don't do that. What you do is you use an address that your device does know how to get to, and that's because it's a directly connected address. So what, we're, and that's what I'm using here. I've got a slash 31 and I'm one end of the slash 31 and my peer is the, is the other end of it. So the device knows how to get to the end of that device because it, of that subnet because it's got a layer three interface on that subnet. Right, so that's it with eBGP and peering. You can use loopbacks for eBGP, but you have to declare the hops, All right? I'll do that in another video. Okay, now, and another thing here, actually. Uh, when I first started configuring BGP a long time ago, there was an assumption that if you were going to set a neighbor you would and run BGP, you would always be running the address family of IPv4 unicast, that you always wanted to send IPv4 unicast prefixes. But that's not the case anymore. Because there's so many different flavors of BGP and the different address families like layer 2, IPv6, multicast, etc, etc. There's a good chance that you aren't actually sending IPv4 unicast. So that's not turned on by default anymore. Now you have the neighbor, you configure that where the AES is, but then you have to activate each one of the address families against that neighbor. So that's what we do now. We go into the address family, okay? I'll show you those there. So that's, we've got IPv4, we've got V6, and we've got layer two VPN. So layer two VPN is for eVPN. More about that in a future video. We are just going to stick with IPv4 unicast today. And this is where we turn that functionality on for our neighbor. So we activate. Okay, so that's that. If I can spell exit, we'll come out of there. And to have a quick look at that, the summary, you can see if, so if we do show BGP, question mark, and then, oh, and I should mention that I'm putting everything in default. I haven't referenced a VRF at all, have I? So that what that means is that everything will be going into the default VRF. Right, so here we've got the different address families. So you can do the summary per address family, or you can just put in all, which is what I'm going to do. Okay, and we do summary. And there you can see it's idle at the moment. We've got our neighbor in there, the remote AS, and we have details such as our local AS, the router identifier, the timers, and log neighbor changes. Okay, good. What I need to do now is jump over to my other device, this two. 
and essentially do the same thing. But for a different AS, so 65002, I'll go router ID 02, let's log those changes. And what is it, neighbor? Right, dot zero dot fifty and the remote AS is six five zero zero one of course. Then we go into the address family and I can up arrow here and we activate. Okay, good. Jumping over to dash one then. We'll do everything from dash one's point of view. Pull that across. Okay, let's have a look at that summary. Okay, good. So our neighbor now has changed to established. That's what we want to see. We're not sending anything. So if I, to look at the table, actually, you take off summary. So just show BGP all will give you the table. You can see there's no prefixes being sent because we haven't injected any yet. But in the summary, you can see that our neighbor is established. That's the state that we're looking for. And if we jump over to Wireshark, I'm filtering on BGP and TCP here, you can see the TCP. So that's where dash one was sending, but dash two wasn't ready. So you can see the SYN and you can see the port there. So it's 179 being the TCP port. If you're doing any exams around BGP, that needs to be burned into your memory. So it's port um, 179 there, and you've got the SYN, SYNAC, and ACK there to open up the TCP session for BGP. Then we've got the open message, and the open message carried some BGP important information, such as the MyS. So this is dash two sending to dash one. You've got the hold timer identifier, etc. Optional parameters have got different capabilities in there. So that's the address families that are turned on, I believe. Yeah, V4 is turned on there, Unicast. And then you've got root refresh, graceful restart, and support for the four octet AS number capability, which I'm not used, taking advantage of at the moment. Dash one sends back there. And then we've got some keeper lives. The update message, now that's important as well, but doesn't have anything in it at the moment because we haven't injected any networks to, into BGP yet. I'll take off TCP from the filtering to make it a bit cleaner. Can I do that? Yeah, there we are. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject a couple of routes on dash two and then we'll look at them being received on dash one. Let's show you the configuration. In the configuration, I've got this extra loop back 99 and I've got this static route to a black hole 98 slash 24. So I'm going to use a network statement for the loop back and I'm going to do use redistribute static for the static route. So we're injecting routes in different ways. So you can see the differences there. Okay, router. BGP 65002, we'll go into the address family, we go networks, so this is how you inject an address directly, You that's the address of the loopback, and you have to put the mask, and then the other one I said was redistribute static, wasn't it? Okay, so if we look at BGP IPv4, yeah, unicast, We've got the table here. So this is where we are injecting the two routes. In the table, you can see you've got the this key here that gives you the information. You're looking here for, you want valid. So that's the star next to it. Also, we've got best because we've only got one path to that prefix. We've injected it here on dash two. So the next hop is zero, local preference is 100. And also of interest, is here, it's under path, but there's no path because we're injected it. It's actually the origin code. And what you can see is that the origin, so the, this is the origin attribute that is added to the prefixes. 99, the loopback, which we use the network statement for, has got an origin of IGP, so that I there. But because we redistributed the static, the static has a question mark, which is incomplete. And not to go deep into the uh, origin attribute too much, but it's essentially like that the network statement injected prefixes are slightly more preferred 
than ones that are just redistributed in. Okay, let's go over to, it's a bit more interesting on dash one. So let's go over to dash one because that will have an AS path at least. IPv4 unicast. Okay, so we can see them coming in. We've got the stars next to them best and you've got the E because it's an eBGP learnt prefix. We've also got the next hop, the next hop being the other end of the link. You've got local preference. You've got a path in there as well because it's become from the AS65002. And there you can see the origin codes as well. So you've got I and a question mark. Okay, you can go deeper into that. If you put the exact root in and the mask, you get even more information. Okay, so that's where we've got a lot of information about their attributes. You've got things like if you had communities against it, if it had router IDs for, the, for root reflectors, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, things that we're not using at this moment. But there's a lot of information in there. Now, if we jump over to Wireshark, Wireshark, we're looking for an update because it's the update messages that are used to send the prefixes. So here's an update, and then you have all of that information in the path attribute. So we've got the next top, the as path and the origin. So you can see it all there in your Wireshark. This, I think if you're, this is the point I made about if you're trying to learn BGP, you can see it right in front of you if you look at Wireshark captures. Then we've got this network layer reachability information, the NLRI, and that is, so that's 99. So this is for the loopback, the origin, yeah, being IGP, open that up and you've got the length and the prefix this is going to be the other one then so that's for the static 98 with a path length of 24 and it is incomplete so you've got the different attributes in there now the other thing i was going to do is what if we go over here and we remove a root so how does that work yeah wrong as Thankfully, it warned me. Okay. Now, if we go into the address family and we do no, we'll take out the redistribution. Okay. Now, we'll jump over. And you can see that there is the 98 is gone now. How does that work then? Well, it's with an update. So we get an update from dash two to dash one to withdraw update messages can add new prefixes but they can also withdraw them so this is a withdraw in an update and it's got the withdraw roots there we are we are because i've taken off the redistribute static we're withdrawing those prefixes the i know it's only one but if there's multiple it'd be ta taking them all out that we have sent because of the redistribute static so we've taken that one out and you see it there so you can see it all in operation Okay, the final step then is to introduce my third 6300 and get BGP running to a third AS. As a quick reminder then, off camera I have added in this third 6300 in a different AS 65003. I'm going to inject the roots on dash 2 still. I need to add in the extra neighbor statements on dash 1 and dash 2. I'll show you the configuration on dash 1 and then you'll be able to see that I have multiple paths to the prefixes being advertised by dash two. Here I am back on dash one. I'll show you the configuration for, just for BGP. As you can see, I've added in that extra neighbor. So it's 192.168.51.1, the remote AS being 65003. And of course, I have activated it in the IPv4 unicast address family. Let's have a look at that summary. We'll go specific as well. Uni, unicast summary. Now we have the two neighbors and this is dash three that's been up for a, coming up to seven minutes and it, it is established. So let us have a look. We'll take off summary and have a look at the table. Here's the BGP table for IPv4 unicast. I'm just focusing on that single prefix that I injected 
via the network statement. So that was the loop back on dash two, 99001. We've got two entries that are the same at the network layer, but there's lots of other information here that you can pick out, which shows that one path is preferred over the other. Now let's have, a, let's compare them then. So the next hops are different. The top one in the third octet, dot 50, that's going to dash two, and the bottom one is going via dash three. If we look across here, local preference is the same, weight's the same. Now path is different. That's because the prefix originated in AS65002 and then was advertised directly across to 65001, our local device. So we just have one AS in the path, but in this lower entry, the prefix would have gone from two to three down to one. So it's gone through a different AS. And the way that you read this is from right to left. So the one on the entry on the right is where it's originated and then and then we have the AS is that it's moved through until we reach the leftmost, which would be the neighboring AS that it's been injected from, all other things being equal. So what we've done is we've gone from the originating AS 65002, it's gone through 65003, and it's arrived at our local BGP speaker. So the path via 2 is shorter than via 2 to 3 to 1. Okay, right, and what that means then, if we look over on the left here, both of them are valid. Remember, you can see the key if you're not sure what these things are. Both of them are valid, but only one has this arrow, this right pointing arrow, okay? I'm not sure if there's a more technical term for that. I just looked it up quickly and people were just using the symbol. <laughs> so I'm just gonna call it the arrow. I oh, want to know, is it a chevron or whatever? Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> apologies if I'm mangling the uh, technical terms for these but I've just called it the arrow there okay um now and what does that mean well this one at the top the top entry is the one that we will take okay so that's the best path because it's got the shorter AS path here so it's a quick way that you can see if you've got multiple paths to a prefix which one is the preferred one it will be the one with best next to it. And I think we should be able to show IP root 99001. Okay, and you can check there in the routing table. So the way that the routing table is built is that the different routing protocols, if you've got multiple running on the device, they offer up their best routes up to the routing, pro, uh, up to the routing table, and then the device picks the best one to route via. In this case, we've just got BGP running and BGP has offered up its best route to the routing table. So we don't see the path via dash three. We only see the one via and this is dash two. So that's the, the path that we're going to take and you can see that in the routing table. So it's a bit like when I visualize it in my head, I kind of think like the different routing protocols that are kind of below, they're at a more fundamental level, and then they offer up to the routing table their preferred paths, and then the routing table that, that works out which is the best route by using admin distance to measure up the different prefixes that the routing protocols have given it. Okay, but that's a bit off topic. And the last thing that I forgot to show you actually is the log. Okay, um, I turned on logging for the BGP peers with BGP log changes. What was it? BGP log hyphen neighbor changes. Uh, I'll clear off the BGP session so you can see. Let's clear the BGP sessions with clear BGP star. Don't do that in production. Now, if we look at the events, we can put this flag in dash C and then you can focus just on BGP. We'll see, yeah, we, so this is where I cleared it off and this is where the peer has come back up. So we've got, and you've got the peer address there. So you've got up down messages in the log. Now I'll just, if we go in and I will, what router BGP one, we'll take off that logging. No, what is it? There's no hyphen. Fine. Uh, if we do that, I will well, clear the events and we'll clear BGP star. So this would be the default. Let's have a look at the events then. So you don't get you don't get those entries for BGP going up and down. If we go, uh, we'll put it back on. 
computer BGP 65001 BGP log tab that and I will I'll clear BGP start let's clear it a few times and look at the events yeah see you got the up down messages there's a lot of information there um, now you can see you've got the neighbor address and the up down message so you've got the choice there whether you want to see that in your log or not okay that's it for this video another entry to my aruba aos cx basics series my plan is to go on to ibgp then looking at vxlan and building up the layers of technology to look at spine and leaf with evpn if you'd like to see something else please leave a comment i do regularly check those and I should also say, actually, the channel recently passed 15,000 subscribers. So thank you very much for your support, all, your, all the subscribers, all the likes, comments and the dislikes. All the views do help. I know that that isn't so much to write home about in this age of technology channels having over a million subscribers. But it's been quite a long path here. I think we're coming up to the fifth anniversary and all of that support is very much appreciated by myself and everybody that works on these videos for the channel to help the technical community. I think that just leaves me to say, thank you very much for watching. My name is Joe Neville and goodbye.